Good morning, Jamestown, Cleveland, and New Home Church members. It's good to meet you, although not face to face, but shall we say, hi there, elbow to elbow, or fist to fist. It's good to have you gathered around a screen somewhere, and even if we have some people that are not uh, of this district, welcome to our live stream this morning. It's good to have you with us, and I pray that the time that we spend together around God's word will be very profitable for each one of us. To begin with, let us uh, bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that even though we look tough on the outside, we are afraid of what is going on around us in life. We might brush it off as being un, uh, given undue attention as fake or blown out of proportion news. But this whole thing with the virus creeping into how we live and how we conduct our lives is quite scary. As we open your word to us today, please point us in a direction that would make it possible for each one to face all of this and be victorious in this whole thing. Amen. I hope you have been keeping safe and that you are all healthy and that it will remain so for the next few weeks until we will be able to get together again and meet as God's families in our respective churches. Now just remember, just because we are not gathered in this building, because we are the church, the church is meeting, and the church is still in the world today. I would like for us to uh, do our family time of prayer together, even though we are not together, but for the beautiful uh, blessings of technology. And although we don't have a list of uh, things to pray for, I would like to invite you in any case to bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us as your family to be together this morning. Thank you for granting us technology that makes it possible for each one of us to not only be connected with you, but in a way be connected with one another as we await your blessings. And uh, I pray that none of us will uh, not get any of it, that each one of us will be truly blessed because we have decided to be together around a screen somewhere with the rest of your family in this district and even further afield. We want to bring before you, Lord, those who are sick, be it sick of this virus and perhaps are facing dire moments in their lives. I pray that you will reach out to them and touch them and, and heal them. Maybe it's just something else, but serious enough too. And we pray that you will reach out to each one that needs you, be it physical, be it mentally, be it in any way that we might be in need of you. We might be strapped financially because all of what is happening around us right now has deployed our finances. And maybe we need to get to a doctor and just don't see the way to do it. And even though gas prices has gone down, 
we might not have to, enough to, uh, to even get gas in our cars. There are so many challenges that we can face. Family members that are in situations where we hoped they would never get into. Maybe we know somebody that has been incarcerated. Be with them where they are. Maybe we know of somebody that has faced the shadows, the valley of death, and I pray that you will be with them. Those that mourn, that are in need of your attention, of your life-giving existence in their own lives. May they experience that in a very special way. Thank you that we can th be here in through your good grace. And I pray that we will be examples of the grace of God to a lost, dying world, and that they will find Jesus in us and through us and follow you too. Help us to be the kind of people that the world need in times like these. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Usually, we would take up an offering uh, and tithe when we gather at church. But because we're not there, that is not totally possible for us. But at this time, I would like to invite you to uh, get a pen out and write something down. Because... This is a way that you can keep on helping the church to be there and reach out and reach in, even while we are not there to give it our financial support. Adventistgiving.org Adventistgiving.org is a web page for those who have not used it in the past, where you can make online contributions to the church, and you can do it either to your local congregation, or if you are not enrolled, you can do it to the local conference. So s look for the Dakota Conference, and the Dakota Conference will, when they find your contribution, directed to your local church because they know where everybody goes to church at and are willing and ready to divert any giving towards the local church. So remember, AdventistGiving.org and that will help you to make your weekly contributions so that we can keep on going. Keeping the air con on, keeping the heat on uh, when we need electricity, that that is uh, ready and available to acquire Sabbath school quarterlies, whatever else it is that the church needs to go on. Oh, and yes, remember, the pastor also need to, to be paid for being at home for a week or two. <laughs> uh, yes. This is uh, a way of uh, keeping up with tithes and offerings, and I hope that you will do that. Now, usually we also have a little time for the kids. So, parents, just uh, move out of the way for a little bit so that the children can have screen time. And this is us, just having a little bit of time with one another. Uh, pastor and kids. Hi, kids. Hope you're doing well. And that spring break was good. And now I believe spring break is being extended. I hope you will be good doing this week that comes and not give mom and dad a too hard time. Let me tell you a story about... Uh, Jake and his sister, Janet. They were a twin. Mm, 
hmm, I know that there are some twins uh, around some of the screens that are looking at what is happening today. So Jake and Janet, a brother and a sister twin, were a little envious one of the other and didn't always like to share the limelight with the other one. Jake especially was a little uh, hmm, envious of his sister. So one day, in a little art class that mom had for them at home, mom took out a pair of old silk stockings and gave the foot part of it to each one of the kids. And then she gave them some moss. It was almost time for things to begin to grow, and moss is a very good agent for things to grow in. And they, they kind of uh, put the moss in the foot of the silk stocking, and then mom gave them some seeds. And they were supposed to put these seeds into the head of the little silk stocking. And they eventually, after they did that, had a little, you, no, not a human being, but a little being, a little doll, each of them. And as the days passed by, the seeds in the little doll started sprouting. And it was so funny. These little silk stocking dolls having green hair. But for some reason, Jake's didn't grow as well as Janet's. And he decided that he was going to get rid of Janet's doll because he was envious, a little jealous. And when she wasn't looking, he took the doll and he ran out to the playpen sandbox outside, dig a hole, and buried it right there in that playpen in the sandbox. Janet started looking for her doll. Couldn't find it anywhere. Jake, do you know where the doll is? No, I only have mine. And she went on looking, 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 and couldn't find it anywhere. Eventually, she decided that uh, it must have broken and it was uh, gone. That night, it rained. And two days later on, Dad came back into the house and he said, Jake, do you know anything about Janet's doll? No, I've not seen it, he said. Well, I want you to come with me and, and tell me what do you say about this. And Dad took him to the sandbox, and there in the sandbox, all the seeds in Janet's doll sprouted and the form of a doll was growing out of the sand in the sandbox. And Jake knew he was found out and he was very sorry. And he uh, profoundly asked, his sister to forgive him, which she did because she was a kind-hearted soul. But here is the lesson from our story. Sometimes we think we can do things and nobody will know about that. But the reality is our sins usually, and the Bible says always, will find us out. So don't think that you can do something that nobody knows about. We will be found out. 
And when we do, uh, it's not going to be so good. And it wasn't all that good for Jake after all, too. Although he asked his sister's pardon, Dad needed to teach him a lesson. And oh, it was hard on his behind. <laughs> Please, don't, don't think that you won't be found out. The lesson from the Bible is that we are always found out no matter what we do, especially when it was something that wasn't right. Let us now go back to our sermon for today. Looking at the week and the month past, I have to ask, what has happened to us? In the last few weeks, days, we have become the prisoners of time and of space, and mostly of our homes. And some of us might have developed a little bit of cabin fever, fever already. Wherever you shop now, wherever you go just about, one is surrounded by the gloom of the virus. And I thought that maybe we should take a moment just to talk about how it impacts our lives as well. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, we read, Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid and go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Go do not be afraid. In this scripture verse, coming from the events of Jesus' resurrection, when he finally overcame death, and death forever lost its dominion over us, if we are in him, the term, do not be afraid, can be spotted as a reference from a number of other instances all over scripture where we are invited not to be afraid of the things that we live through in this life. A friend of mine and myself, when we were just kids, had a wonderful opportunity living in a small town back in South Africa. Small enough so that yards would have some fruit trees and my friend's house even had a date tree, a palm tree, in the front of their yard. And it was our great a uh, privilege, if I can say or name it a privilege, to pick those dates and instead of eating them, threw them at cars as they passed by in the street. One guy wasn't too intrigued by what we did. He stopped got out of his car, and with a shaking fist, he was going around shouting at us, telling us that he was going to phone the police, and soon enough, we delinquent kids would be in jail. I really got the fright of my life. I was so scared. I ran back home, and without talking to anybody, I went right to my mother's room and hid myself under my parents' bed. Nobody, but nobody, was going to catch me there. The country that I lived in had passed laws at the time, which meant that from time to time, police would come and knock on doors to make sure that 
the people living and working in homes had passes and were legal. And coincidentally, while I was hanging around underneath my parents' bed, there was a knock at the door. And from underneath the bed, I could see the front door as my mother opened it, and I saw the big black shoes, followed by blue pants, worn by police officers, not knowing that he was a pass law inspector, I thought that he came for me because I threw dates at somebody else's car. Fortunately, it wasn't for me. But I can tell you, I was scared. A child would fear that didn't amount to much. But Let's face it, fear is real, and it makes us react in weird and interesting ways. There's long lists of things that we usually are afraid of. Have you ever taken the time to make a list of what you are afraid of? A Gallup poll a while back actually did exactly that, and they determined what scares Americans the most. I wonder if you could guess what most Americans are the most afraid of. Snakes. Followed by what I am doing, public speaking. Then Americans are afraid of heights, being closed in in small spaces, spiders, needles, and getting shots, mice. In the eighth place, Americans are still afraid of flying on airplanes. There are quite a number that are scared about, of dogs, thunder and lightning, going to the doctor, and at number 12, a bunch of Americans, not kids, but adults, are still scared of the dark. We might have counted ourselves in that list in some way or the other. And sometimes we are totally embarrassed by the things that we are scared of because they seem so unreasonable to others, but not to ourselves. A certain girl by the name of Katie Medrano also recently published a list in an article in which she categorized the 10 strongest human fears. It's a general list, categorized, as I said. And here is how she categorized it from number 10 down to number one. Losing our freedom, not knowing what is coming a fear for the unknown. We fear pain, disappointment, misery, loneliness, ridicule, rejection. We fear death in the second place. And above all, we fear failure. And I'm quite sure that if the virus was included, the impact it would have had on our lives would even have exceeded the number one failure at the moment. Because how it impacts our lives, how it impacts our economy, how it impacts our future, definitely shadows how we live 
and how we conduct our lives daily. But what happens when we see a list like this is that it makes us aware that somewhere in there we have something that could be called a phobia. And it drives our lives in a certain way. Or we could even say that it makes it stop in some ways. When we turn on the radio or our television sets, we are introduced daily with new things that awakens the fear in our lives, that makes us run somewhere very fast, not knowing exactly where it is, or freezes up, freezes us up where we are not being able to do anything about it. And the virus came and did exactly that, not only to our community, to our country, but to the whole wide world. If it's not another mass shooting, at an open air concert or in a church. It's a lunatic that drives into groups of assembled people, killing them for no sound reason at all. We go and we see the doctor and receive news that life is not going to be what it used to be and that we will not be around forever. We see the health of a loved one failing and we don't know what to do about it or how we should, can handle it. We notice the cracks in our relationships, our marriages with our children, with loved ones, and it just grows deeper and wider and we seem unable to fix it and we are Scared. We are frightened about what is happening to us, for what we are losing, for what we've had, for what we have. And instead of living life joyfully, we are scared and life becomes a dreadful existence only. When a baby is born, it's just about always surrounded by joy. I remember so well when I got home one day and my wife said, you know what? We are going to be parents. I was so happy. This was something that I wanted so badly. And then that day came. I was supposed to preach that morning. It was a Sabbath morning very early when she woke me and said, we better get to the hospital. And I was there when our first boy took his first breath and his yell filled the room. Wow, I was so happy. And I had to smile just the other day when a friend of mine sat with us while we were having a meal together and his phone rang. And from a different country, he had his daughter say, Dad, I have some great news for you. You are going to be a granddaddy. He didn't finish his meal. I have no idea why not. He was so excited being a granddad. Usually when children are born, when new life begins, we are surrounded by joy. But 
Unfortunately, that is not how it stays. Something throughout life changes, and instead of being joyous all the time, we get to the place where we are filled with fear and trepidation. What is it that steals away the joys of our life? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter begins to tell us something about where the joys of life gets rerouted. Be alert and of sober mind, he says. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan comes and steals away our joy by the way he attacks us and carve away the basis on which our joys are built. To this, the Apostle Paul adds, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, uh, verse 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. We have an enemy on the prowl. And looking at his handiwork, it instills fear in us. Fear is such a basic human emotion that many of us constantly live in the grip of it and are filled with worry and anxiety. What do we do when our fears seem to be winning the day? What do we do when this virus steals away the life that we are used to? What if you come and pray to God and he still hasn't come through for you as you have expected him to do? If you are like most people, you begin to lose hope and you wonder why you bothered to pray in the first place. And deep in the soil of our hearts, seeds of doubt begins to take root and they grow up into a harvest of frustration and anger and even more fear. And the sad thing is that it happens to most of us eventually. Even some of the best men and women mentioned in the Bible struggled with their inner doubts as well when their dreams did not come to pass the way they dreamt them. Comes Peter and he says this, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 14, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. This is something that Peter implores us to do. Don't fear the threats given by Satan and his angels. And do not be frightened. Yeah, Peter, it's easy for you to talk. You have no idea what the virus is doing to us. But let's just 
take a quick look at where Peter is when he writes these words. He's writing to believers who are in the shadow of Nero's horrible persecution of first century Christians. These believers had not yet experienced it, but all of them faced the prospect of trials and persecution. And because of that, they faced death as well. These believers were afraid for what was coming in their near future. Do not be surprised, Peter goes on, at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter is telling them that there are hard times coming and they shouldn't be surprised and they should know that this is something that is given by God, allowed by God to test us so that we can be strong in conquering the devil who is going around trying to devour us, trying to steal away the joy of our lives. And yes, it's true that some of us are afraid that our freedoms are being eroded and that our children may not enjoy the blessings that have been given to us. And many are deeply burdened for loved ones who do not honor Jesus Christ as we do and we think they should. We see them making bad choices, and we are afraid of what it will lead to and what will happen at the end. And often our fears of what lies ahead is harder to bear than the reality of it when it actually comes. What will I do if? How will I cope? When? You know those questions. And the Bible talks about the valley of the shadow of death to us in Psalms 23, verse 4. And that is what this is about. A shadow can sometimes be worse than the reality. Have you ever played those games with a candlelight or maybe a flashlight in the dark where you uh, hold your hands in, in, a different, uh, in some way and then looks at the shadow gross, gro <laughs> grotesque on the wall. Sometimes the shadow is worse than the original, than what we are fearing for. Once I visited with somebody that was slowly slipping out of life. And the person said to me, Pastor, you know, it's not the dying that I'm afraid of, but it is this whole process of everything that leads to it. All those questions. What if I did do that? What if I didn't do that? How would this have impacted where I'm at right now? How if I changed my life, changed the direction at a certain point? And sometimes we are frightened by these thoughts, these shadows. But the Lord's promise is, I will be there for you even when you pass through the shadows of the valley of death. Now these Christians that Peter writes to are in the most difficult position. They are face facing the fear of violence the fear of persecution, and the fear of loved ones being lost. 
apart from being lost or losing their lives themselves. Peter, who is their pastor and their shepherd, is writing to help them face these fears they have. And he is also writing to us, helping us to face the fears which we have. The answer, the bottom line of what Peter comes and says is something that appears also in the heart of Christ's incarnation. When the angels appear at the birth of Christ, can you remember what the first words were that he said to those waiting? Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. Luke chapter 2 verse 10. Why did Jesus come into the world? What was the incarnation all about? There's many answers throughout the New Testament. But in the book of Hebrews, I find one that really speaks to us in the moment and in the situation that we find ourselves today. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, and here is what it says. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Why did Jesus come to this world? He came to be God with us, and in being with us, he came to break the fear we have of the ultimate enemy we have, death. Doesn't it describe almost to a T the situation that we have here in America today? There is a real fear, and it is sweeping across the country. What is going to happen next? What if I get caught in the crosshairs of the virus. Jesus came into this world precisely for this reason. That we should be delivered from living our lives in chronic enslaving fear of the latest danger that stalks the world. To what Peter already said, but even if you should suffer for what it is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. He now comes and adds this. But is your hearts, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. When Christ is the Lord of your life and mine, we have a reason to be confident. Our Savior is Jesus Christ. And with him, no matter what it is that befalls us, no matter which way he leads us, we can go confidently knowing that he is our sovereign and therefore will take us through it all. Yes, Jesus Christ was the sovereign over your birth. 
He is the sovereign over your life, and he will be the sovereign over your death if you add yourself to his family. Encased between two proclamations, one at his birth and one when he triumphantly leaves this world, victorious over death, and as the ruler uh, over the ruler of darkness lies what should be the pattern of our lives fear not because he is in control fear not for he is the sovereign of our lives sovereign over our lives means that all that has happened to you, the good that you have enjoyed, and even the not so good that you have suffered, was known to God before the beginning of time. Life is full of surprises for us. They are unexpected twists and turns. But let me assure you, there is nothing but nothing that ever comes to God as a surprise. Before a word is on my tongue, God knows it completely. He even knows the number of my hair. And God's sovereignty over your life means that God works through all that has happened in our past and whatever will happen in the future to advance the great purpose that he has for each one of us and for which he brought us into being. I think that is what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says, for those who love God, all things work together for good. Romans 8.28 God's good purpose is that a reflection of his dearly beloved son will radiate from you for his glory and for our joy forever. There's a story about Martin Luther that I would like to share with you. He was going through a period of discouragement and depression. So feel assured, feel comfortable with the fact that all of us sometimes have that. But while Martin Luther was going through this, for days his long face graced the family table, and dampened the family's joyous home life. So one day, his wife came to the breakfast table and she was dressed in black as if she was going to a funeral. Martin asked her, who had died? And she said, Martin. The way that you have been behaving lately, I thought God had died. So I came prepared to attend his funeral today. The gentle <laughs> but effective rebuke from his wife drove Lu straight to Luther's heart. And as a result, the great reformer resolved never again to follow worldly care or to allow worldly care and resentment and depression and discouragement or frustration to defeat him. By God's grace, he vowed he would submit his life to the Savior and reflect his grace in a spirit of rejoicing whatever came. Remember, Jesus came into this world to underscore his sovereignty in this world. And he left 
this world. Victorious. The grave couldn't hold him. And it is him that says, don't fear. I've got you covered. Let's trust him, my friends. Let's, let's trust him completely. Sleep like one who knows our Heavenly Father has it all under control. And even if the virus scares you, don't fear. Because God is near. And because he's here, he will carry us through. He will take us to the end of this. And we will know, even though we were in the shadows of the darkness of death, he was, is our shepherd, and we will want nothing. Amen. Let us pray. Many things scare us, Lord. Many things that we feel we have no influence over, that we cannot in any way direct. But thank you for the knowledge that you are there and that while you are in control, we have nothing to fear. Help us trust you. Help us not to fear. Help us to sleep in the joy of the Lord until he comes and removes forever everything that could ever steal away our joy from our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.